No, sir. Ms. Baker. Here. Mr. Cox. Mr. Dominic. Mr. Epperson. Here. Mr. Escobar. Jake Dillon. Present. Mr. Lynn. Here. Ms. Lynch. Here. Ms. McCullough. Here. Mr. Pearson. Present. Mr. Smith. Mr. Thibodeau. Here. Have a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Spears. Uh, for the record, Mr. Cox had called and said he had a family emergency and will not be here as a result of that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to have the invocation, which we've been given by a member of Shreveport Green, and the pledge be led by one of those members as well. Please bow your heads. Father God, we come to you once again thanking you for the traveling grace that you've bestowed upon us to arrive here today, Lord. And let we ask that you please bless all these commission members so that they might make sound decisions, Lord, so that they may be pleasing unto you, Father God. And let we thank you for all the attendants here and the Shreveport Green core members that are here to present today, Father God. And let we thank you for all the many things that you have done for this parish and shall do, Father God. And in your son Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen. Have the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, through liberty and justice for all. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back in the stone age again today, so with the old hand vote, hand flag down, whatever. At this time, if there are no objections, I would like to go ahead and move the agenda around a little bit to allow Ms. Curtis from Shreveport Green to make the presentation so these children can get on with their busy lives. Thank you so much. These young people have been working since before 7 o'clock this morning, and uh, we kept them a little later to come up here and meet you all. Thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us to be able to offer these young people a summer of service. We have three that will speak very briefly about their projects, some of the things they're doing, and some of the things they've learned. We won't run over three minutes. I told them we have to be very concise. They've written their own words, their own uh, things that they'd like to say to you, and it's, it's been a very good summer. As you all are aware, we've had a, a tough year, um, but we've pulled together and we were extremely vigilant and very, very careful with our selection this year from our, of our young people. So these people ca had went through a rigorous exam, uh, personal interviews, uh, background, talking to the to people that knew them, their teachers, their principals. We've just had a great, a great group of young people, and I'm so proud of them. They're going to school all over the all over the state, all over the region, uh, from right here, Bixby Southern to Grambling Tech. Uh, Northeast, Northwest, LSU, all around, and they all earn a scholarship. The, the ones that are here for the 300 hours this summer will earn a thousand dollar scholarship, which goes directly toward their school. They're also learning, earning a living allowance, and it's a wonderful experience. We have had tremendous support from the parish, namely, I'm going to call names Larry. <laughs> Larry Raymond has been so wonderful. Uh, helping us with one of the tents and with our earth camp and with helping us with projects. Just invaluable people working for you. You're to be congratulated for having such a great team on the ground here. Now I'd like Chris Lynn Whitaker to say a few words. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I spoke last year, if you remember me, but um, <laughs> I would just like to say that as you know, we have gone through quite a bit this year. And um, in spite of what fate has brought us, we have a wonderful group of young people this summer that's working for us. And you will see all the many things that they do throughout the parish, throughout the city. Um, this is my third year, over two years, as an Earth Camp counselor, and now I am an Earth Camp instructor. So. Some people think I'm crazy for working with kids so long, but I love it, so. Um, we have Miss Jerry Tynes and Miss Lakeithia Givens who will come and speak to you about their experiences. Jerry is also from Earth Camp, so she will tell you a bit more about what I do as well. And Lakeithia is on one of the green teams, and those are the ones that do what you see outside, picking up trash, cutting grass, maintaining lawns, <coughs> helping elderly families, and things like that. So, with further, without further ado, 
Miss Jerry Sutano. Hello, um, my name is Jerry Sue Tynes and I'm a Shreve Corps member. This summer I have been given the opportunity to be an Earth Camp Counselor at Lockerbie Jacobs Nature Park. Yes. Our team of four will give over 300 children ages 7 to 11 a chance to experience nature hands-on. Our camp is a half-day, one-week experience giving these young people the opportunity to learn new things such as identifying native animals as well as birds and insects. We work in the tree farm as well, identifying trees and learning about their benefits. We also stress the importance of keeping our environment and our state clean and healthy. Just like Shreveport Green, we work with the children to reduce, reuse, and recycle. <coughs> over our two-month program, we will impact over 300 children. Thank you so much for the support you give to this program because I am only one person representing 32 proud members of Shreve Corps. We truly appreciate what you do. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. <coughs> Everyone, my name is Lakeitha Gibbons. I'm 23 years old and I'm also part of Green Team too. This is my first year as a volunteer for AmeriCorps. It has been an awesome opportunity in every aspect. I joined AmeriCorps to learn about the community and provide outstanding commitment in customer service and community service. I will be attending Southern University in the fall. The scholarship that I will be receiving at the end of the term will be helpful towards achieving my nursing degree. AmeriCorps to me has not provided just a good opportunity opportunity, but it has also been very educational. I have learned numerous skills that I will be able to take and run with for the rest of my life. At times I'm eager to know what we will be doing next because I know for a fact that I will be learn that I will learn a new skill and at the same time soak in new knowledge. Since I have been part of my team I have learned different things about each and every one I work with. We are all different in our own ways but when it comes to com community service and support we all feel the same way. What we do as AmeriCorps volunteers is make things healthy and look beautiful. We take action when no one is looking and we stand on common ground. We are proud of the community and the work we do. We are ambitious, generous, determined, and motivated to get the job done. We are your 2010 summertime AmeriCorps volunteers. So I say to you on behalf of all the AmeriCorps volunteers, thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity to a body future. Thank you. Yeah. And just to reiterate, we are very thankful for your endless support, monetarily, physically, mo whatever, spiritually, by praying for us, whatever you've given to us, we really do appreciate it. Because without you, obviously, we would not be able to do all that we do. And this is not just for us, but it is for the entire world. So we thank you once again. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now we'll proceed. Uh, are there any agenda additions at this time? I see no one. Next, I need a motion to adopt the minutes of the regular meeting on June 3rd and June 17th. So moved. Mm -hmm. Moved by Commissioner Land. Second. Second by Commissioner Pearson. Is there any discussion on this motion? And without exception, that passes unanimously. Special resolutions, we have none. None, sir. Communication reports, Mr. Wilson. Okay, none today, sir. We have none. Ms. Lynch. I have uh, two. One is from the Northwest Louisiana Airline Task Force. Um, the, um, you all know the mayor of Shreveport formed this task force. It's a regional task force that includes uh, several cities and uh, Cattle Parish is a part of that. Uh, we as a staff and commission use the Shreveport Regional Airport exclusively for all of our business travel because we have a vested interest in having a, uh, in sustaining the success of our local airport. Airports are a catalyst for economic development and have the ability to 
not only create jobs, but to attract businesses and increase tourism. One of the uh, studies that we looked at said that airports operations reflect the level of economic development, business activity, and tourism of the communities in which they operate. The, as an economic development engine, the success of current airport operations as well as the ability to attract low-cost carriers is largely driven by passenger traffic. Unfortunately, too many of our families are having to drive from anywhere from one to four hours to, um, to catch a plane in order to uh, pay a cheaper fare. And too many of them are willing to do that. They're going to Dallas and to Little Rock and um, Alexandria and some to Tyler and other areas like that. Uh, in one study, it was, it was reported that 25% of a company's sales are dependent upon air transportation and 70% of businesses report that serving a bigger market is a key benefit to their use in air services. Higher fares, of course, uh, adversely affect the bottom line of uh, companies and put many of our local companies at a competitive disadvantage in the national and global marketplace. At Shreveport Regional Airport, these are the things that we do know. That the highest percent of passenger travel is business travel versus leisure travel. And as a result, the airlines make their money uh, from higher fares as opposed to higher volume. Currently, our passenger load numbers are not high enough to support lower fares. Uh, the airport has gone from having a high of 45 flights a day down to a current of 25. Part of this has been attributed to the overall economy. You know, companies are, are not uh, flying as much but also that families are cutting back on travel. But they, uh, they believe that the biggest part is because of leakage, people driving to alternate airports. Another thing we looked at were airport operations, if that could be reduced. And um, we were advised that airport operations are only 5 to 7% of uh, a ticket price. And so even if they reduced their percentage, of operational expense that it wouldn't significantly lower the air ticket prices. President Escaday attended the initial meeting of the task force and I attended the May 10th and June 22nd meetings. In May, the airport administration did a PowerPoint presentation going over all of their operations for the airport. At the June 22nd meeting, airline planner Seabury APG provided an airport assessment summary which I have a copy here, if anyone would like it, it's, it's pretty detailed and uh, thick. Uh, but it provided the initial framework for evaluating the viability and strategy for attracting a low-cost carrier to Shreveport Regional, such as AirTran or Frontier. Southwest Airlines, you can forget that. We don't fit into their model, and I think that has been uh, pretty clear. But AirTran and Frontier are two low-cost carriers that uh, appeared to be more favorable for us to attract over the uh, and start to woo them. The takeaways from the meeting uh, that it's going to basically take a public-private partnership to make this deal fly. The consultant stressed that the business community is largely the driver for attracting a low-cost carrier because they hold the most potential to increasing employment. While public bodies can provide financial incentives uh, these are usually short-term gain, gains and don't really add to the long-term profita profitability of the airlines. Uh, the task force decided that the first order of business was one, to assess what we have, the effectiveness and efficiency of the current airport operations, and to make actionable recommendations for improvements. Secondly, was to do a leakage study of the number of travelers we are losing to alternate airports and to develop a strategy strategy to make Shreveport Regional the airport of choice Some for our they residents. Third is to evaluate the viability of attracting a low-cost carrier to Shreveport and Larry developing Ray a strategy to woo them. He uh, the goal is to have a comprehensive report by December the 1st of 2010. Uh, on the agenda today, we have um, the um, request that was made by the the uh, task force to provide $5,000 in funding towards retaining a consultant okay. to do the assessment, leakage study, and evaluation and strategy for attracting a low-cost carrier. 
So um, if anyone has any questions about it, can answer, hopefully answer them. Good job. Good job. Anyone? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. You have a second one? A second report. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> This uh, is from the, no, it's, it's probably short. Okay, this is from the um, NACO's Large Urban County Caucus uh, Committee Annual Retreat. And uh, as many of you know, the Large Urban County Caucus consists of representatives from the nation one, nation's 100 largest counties in the United States. In Louisiana, Orleans, and Jefferson Parish are members of what's called LUCK. Uh, but they had no active caucus members, and so um, I made a case for us to be included as the fourth largest parish in the state. These large urban county counties, like Caddo Parish, are home to large military installations. Caddo Parish is home to over 20,000 veterans and service members. As such, veterans and military affairs has figured prominently in public policy initiatives of the Commission for Veterans Cemetery to funding for the Office of Veterans Affairs to recently lobbying against state funding cuts. Um, you know, every year we do a veterans program, and of course we have current and past members of the commission, as well as employees who are service members and veterans. And they understand the unique challenges of those who serve or have served, especially those in combat. Um, at our uh, meeting in June, members of the uh, committee were asked to consider um, establishing what is being called an initiative called Honor Not Punishment, which basically they are asking counties to consider uh, setting up veterans courts. These veteran courts are similar to drug courts and to mental health courts, which have <coughs> been successful not only in, only in Cattle Parish, but across the country. We often, you know, pray for our veterans for their safe return, but what we are finding out is that many of them physically return home, whether that's been from the Gulf War, from Iraq, or Afghanistan, but as many as 30% of them suffer from post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury or major depression. And uh, Ms. Shaw and the gentleman that was here Monday talked about mental illness and, and part of, uh, and that's why I raised the issue about the post-traumatic stress and the traumatic brain injury. Um, a 2000 Seven studies said that at least half of the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan do not seek treatment for these conditions. Instead, many of them have t turned to alcohol and drugs to self-medicate, which has led mm -hmm. to entanglements in the cr with the criminal justice system. Uh, these war wounds have led to an upsurge in veterans being arrested for vandalism, misdemeanor drug use and possession, DUIs, traffic violation, and domestic violence the majority of whom had no prior criminal record prior to returning from war. Um, many of the counties are being asked to begin to document the number of veterans and servicemen that are coming into the criminal justice system and diverting them to less costly treatment and more effective treatment programs for nonviolent offenses. Um, some are concerned that it may be, you know, considered a slap on the wrist, but these programs are set up for them to get treatment and if they don't comply or if they re-offend uh, or fail a random drug test, they can be incarcerated or pay a fine. Uh, in another jurisdiction, they have to actually plead guilty first. So if they don't comply, then they actually end up being jailed. Um, the first um, Veterans Court was established in 2008, so it was very new. But since then, there are 36 across the country, uh, quite a few in the state of Texas, in Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, as well as, you know, in other states, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Colorado, New York, California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, all have veterans courts now. There are none in Louisiana. So Cattle Parish has an opportunity to serve as a catalyst for evaluating and analyzing the need for such a program here in partnership perhaps with Bossier and, and surrounding parishes. This will take state enabling legislation to do this, to allow the district courts to um, give 
to allow, the state would have to allow district courts to have the option to create a veterans court. Uh, fortunately, Senator Robert Atley chairs the Senate Select Committee on Veteran Affairs. Senator Buddy Shaw sits on that committee. Representative Jane Smith serves on the House side on the Special Committee on Military and Veteran Affairs. So first, uh, I would like to get the body consensus on further discussing the possibility of Cato uh, serving as a pilot for Veterans Court with NACO representatives uh, when we're at the conference next okay. week. Uh, they have indicated there are resources and technical assistance that they can pr provide us at no cost. And um, when we return, to, I'd like to set up a meeting with those members of our Northwest uh, uh, Louisiana delegation that are on Veteran Affairs Committees in the Senate and the House. Um, I've printed up for everyone copies of, uh, and staff, copies of uh, five or six articles that have been printed about veterans' courts uh, in various jurisdictions for you all's perusal and further consideration of this uh, program. And uh, if we decide to proceed, that we establish an ad hoc military and veteran affairs committee to, you know, include uh, our Northwest Louisiana legislators, both Paris administrators, Bozier and, and Caddo, uh, at least, if not others, you know, DA, sheriff, police chiefs, district court judges, and local and state veteran affairs office. Are there any questions? I have some. Yes, Ms. Baker. Um, one of the things I do know that the VA has here, our veterans have here, is a very strong uh, ORIF, which is Iraqi Freedom and Office of Social Services for the Veterans. They're a very strong organization that supports those that go to war and that need that, um, that need the um, help when they come back from wars and, and fighting. One of the issues that they have is actually getting them to actually uh, participate in the program. And I think one of the things that they're trying to keep them away from is getting into the problems that they're having here, and especially having to go to court, because if they get into trouble and have to go to court, they lose all of their VA benefits. So um, I think one of the things that we can do, if you want to try to pursue some uh, support for those that go to war is to try to find a, an incentive or a way to get them to actually uh, be more involved in this program that they have for them that will help them. Because, I mean, as long as they have been to war, they never get out of the system and they never turn down for the services that they offer. And I think that was one of the things that we can do as a government body is to try to find an incentive way to get the veterans to participate. And also at the same time is to educate our community because our community, i.e. our police and our sheriff's departments, need a little bit more education too on dealing with these type of um, criminals that have served in the wars because they're a little different from the ones that we have here on our streets every day. So um, if we can also incorporate that area it's for supporting that program that they have on that. It is a very strong, very large program um, in Northwest Louisiana. My intention was to ask, Commissioner Cox is not here, but uh, to ask that uh, he and uh, the administrator talk further with NACO representatives and get some additional information and bring that back. Okay. Any other questions from Ms. Lynch? Um, did you say that we're going to, to the uh, uh, committee meetings at NACO about this? Uh, there are persons that will be there that can discuss it further. And you're going to investigate it further? Uh, yes, I'm going to ask Commissioner Cox uh, and the administrator to, to talk with them. Well, maybe at that time when you come back that you, know, you could uh, have, a, 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 have us an overview and give a brief federal report on what would be suggested on how we proceed. Uh, with, with those matters. I don't think there's anybody here in this room that is not committed to or would not want to help our veterans in, in any way. As I may have told you before, in uh, my lifetime, uh, things are a little different. I grew up during the Vietnam War. I was a child, so I watched it on television. Now, now that I'm a grown man, um, uh, 
you tend to see older gentlemen retired their 80s and 90s and the other veterans of war and all and it dawned on me several months ago that um, just in talking to a young man that now there are 20 and 21 and 22 year old veterans of war the whole complexity has changed you never know who you're talking to or where they've been and, and this is going to be a continuing problem and uh, I think I speak for this whole body when I said we certainly want to look for every way we possibly can to support them uh, when they come back after they've done what they've been asked to do. So um, I'm sure you'll bring back some good information on that. Mr. Thibodeau? Uh, today we had an economic development and NGO committee meeting to discuss a funding question of Red River Revel. They had requested uh, $25,000 uh, primarily as, I guess, an emergency request because five out of their eight days last year were rained, pretty much rained out, including the Saturday, which is their largest income producing day. The committee uh, did vote five, five to one in favor of, of funding that request subject to their presenting us a profit and loss statement so that we can, in fact, see uh, exactly where they stand. So that's that's where it is right now. And then of course it would then come to the full commission for a vote. Any questions for Ms. Timidon? Any other communiques? I just have one as a matter of um, just to let you know. Administration will be contacting you. I'm not going to uh, divulge any more information at this time than necessary for obvious reasons. but. We have been, I had two different entities over the last few weeks offer the parish property, r real property, real estate, buildings, valuable property, um, which they're willing to do through active donation. The administration will be contacting you and about your availability to tour these, these, these properties, to look them over and, and determine whether or not we actually want to receive and take ownership of these properties through uh, this donation act. Um, Initially, um, one was through a foundation, and its board had to initially approve that they were going to um, donate this, and that has been done. And um, if there was any secrecy about it, I, I just certainly want to iterate, iterate that it was because word was out, and what we didn't want was to have somebody come and offer to purchase the building. And <laughs> and they must not be able to benefit from it. But anyway, the tours will be imminent. Um, look at it and, and see. Uh, this would give some parish some uh, needed space and, and take care of some future needs. They're basically an asset, but you'll have to determine how and what you feel about them uh, on your own. But those, uh, you will be contacted about those tours. And that's all I have. Any other communiques? Yes, Mr. Jefferson. Okay, once these tours are completed, then will we refer this to an appropriate committee where we can peruse it and, and get into more detail before we make some kind of decision? I mean, what's, you know, would, wouldn't that be on the space utilization? Or? Well, basically, well, if that's, uh, that's what, uh, probably not a bad idea. Uh, and once the, the, the tours are done, then uh, we'll go ahead and take up both issues with space utilization, refer to that committee to recommend whether we receive the donation of the property or not because I know you have questions uh, the committee will have questions in large part most of the research has, has been done as far as structural soundness all of the questions that you'll have so um, once the tours are done uh, if the administration will notify Mr. Epperson and he will call a meeting uh, as soon as possible um, to, to view this one of them is very time sensitive they're very very much wanting for vandalism purposes and things like that to get it done. But anyway, uh, that's how we'll proceed with it. But I think it's best if, if you have the opportunity to look at the property first, and then when you're in committee, you know what you're dealing with rather than do it the other way around. You know, it's just always a good thing. Is that good? Okay. Jeffs? Good for you? Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? All right, now we'll move on. Next we have visitors. We have Mr. Larry Russo. Would you please come forward? State your name and address for the record. How you doing, Larry? Good morning, or I mean, good afternoon. My name is Larry Russo. I reside at 8912 Crestville Road, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71106. 
I am uh, general counsel to Kinsey Interest, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the uh, Kinsey uh, business interest. They own two thirds. They own they own uh, two thirds of a partnership that owns a warehouse facility in the Bickham Dixon Industrial Park, and this is the park that's being considered for rezoning. Apparently, I didn't know what it was being considered for, but I I've discovered it's being considered for rezoning. Uh, we bought that land to be the anchor owner in an industrial park and we built a very nice we spent over two million dollars building a very nice facility housing a very qu high quality tenant that's involved in assembly at the general motors plant they're not involved in heavy manufacturing they don't make a lot of noise they don't spew a lot of dirt or smoke they just run a real clean operation, and if any of you have gone out there, you'll see it's a very nice building. It's well landscaped. In part due, I don't know who maintains the front. I guess the parish maintains the front, but it's a very nice uh, park. There are all types of uh, industrial parks, warehouse facilities. You can drive all over Dallas, Atlanta, Nashville, wherever you want, and you can see uh, what might be called an industrial park that could reside quite nicely next to a residential area. It just depends on what you allow to take place in the industrial park. In fact, when we bought it and we discovered it was zoned I-1, we insisted that they impose further restrictions because we didn't want rock crushers and we didn't want meat processing facilities and livestock operations and so forth next to our facility out there. So this organization acted as the developer. This organization sold us the land. This organization enticed us to go in and spend over $2 million to build a beautiful facility out there. And we were under the impression and represented that we were going to have neighbors that were similarly situated that were going to engage in similar businesses. And now we've got this cloud hanging over the property out there as to what's going to happen to it. And I believe some of you were on the commission when we bought the property. So I consider those of you that were as our sellers. And I consider that you were part of the program to encourage us to go and invest our private dollars out there that are paying taxes to the parish and the city and are helping run the business of the parish and the city. I am not, we are not pleased to hear that there is a move afoot to totally turn over the table on this. Um, with, and no one has called us. No one's knocked on our door to ask us what we think about it. I did know a little bit. I'm not, you know, at some point, uh, the parish attorney called me a, about a question or two, but let me put it this way. No one has come to our door asking us what do you think about this? We asked you to invest over $2 million out there, and we're about to change all that. What do you think about it? How will that affect your business? How will that affect how you feel about doing business with the parish of Caddo in the future? Nobody's come and talked to us about that. So my request of you is, number one, I'm to, to stop, hit the pause button, think about what you're doing. Take some time. It's not like this is really a bad use. Right now we've got major Fortune 500 companies looking for high-end industrial properties in this community because of the Hainesville Shale. We're a very unique place. There's very, very few places in the world right now where people are wanting to build new facilities, much less in the country. I mean, we're in a very unique position. You've got Slumberjay, you got Halliburton, you got Smith Industries, you got, and those are just the household names. They know how to build things nice. They know how to create jobs. They know how to be friendly to the neighbors. So I just don't think we're thinking this through very carefully. If all of a sudden we're going to react to this in this way and seek a change. And, if, and I just want to reiterate, you are my developer. You are my seller. You asked me to come out there and build this project. I came out there, our group came out there, we built the project. We've been a good neighbor. 
we're paying our taxes, we keep it up, it looks good. We don't want to have all that property rezoned to be a, a conflicting use with what we've invested in out there. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. And I'm, we're, our door is open to talk whenever you want to talk about it. Uh, I'm not saying we're inflexible about what you do to protect the neighbors and the, the citizens. We're all about that. But I don't, we're not too excited about a, a drastic or dramatic change that's going to substantially d damage the value of our investment. Now, if you want to buy our investment, think about tearing it down and <coughs> put up some other use. That's something we certainly talk to you about. But to, for a developer to come in and ask us to do what we did, for us to invest over $2 million and then to come and basically pull the rug out from under it and say, that's over, we're changing direction. And by the way, the direction we're going is not going to be very accommodating to what you're doing out there is a problem. And, I, and I'd like to reserve a, a comment on one other thing, but I, it's, I'll wait. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Russo? Ms. Lane. Okay. Um, what year was it that you all bought that property? Well, I should have come more prepared with that information. I'd say it was probably five years ago. Three. Ten. Seven. Yeah, seven, seven, ten years ago. Almost. Is it ten years? Well, it was, was, uh, was 2002-2003. Huh. Oh, okay. So seven to seven years ago. Okay, before my time. Seven, eight years. Okay, and the and the purpose of the construction was to was for a, a uh, manufacturer for GM. Yeah, an assembly 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 unit that accommodate. It's a very integral part. It's a wheel assembly that's going to is important no matter who goes in. I mean, we keep hearing pretty optimistic smoke signals that this plant may not just disappear. That's our hope. I mean, we've got an investment in there that that. And, and this use is one that would continue no matter who's in there because it's a very integral part of the whole automobile assembly process. Okay, when you said that, that more restrictions were imposed, was that just on your facility or just the whole part? The whole part. We put restrictions to be sure you didn't get real loud stuff, smoky stuff, smelly stuff. We just wanted nice, clean, fairly quiet. That was through MPC. We, but no, it's an agreement with your body, with your with the parish. Okay. The, the, the parish commission reviewed, approved those restrictions. At the same time, they authorized the sale of the property. Those we, as a matter of fact, we conditioned our willingness to purchase the property on the willingness of the parish to tone it down a little bit as to what could happen out there. Okay, do, can we? Can I get a copy of that? Those agreements? Yes, ma'am. He's referring to some restrictive covenants that okay. we negotiated with them that are filed of record. And I'll be happy to get you and any other commissioner a copy of them. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, those, those are my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Dominant. Um, how many acres is in the park? Do you know? Or maybe the 38. Yeah, I'd really, yes. How many? 38. Uh, 59. Okay. And y'all, uh, your company owns the building and is leasing it to a tenant. Yes, sir. Thank you. It is, is the building full or does it have? It's full. Okay. Did y'all or do y'all have any intentions to expand? And there's been plenty of discussion about expansion. Of course, right now, no, we'll be waiting. Uh, to I'm sorry? See. Yes, there's been discussion about expansion. We actually have some expansion, a little bit of expansion in ourselves. Mm -hmm. But there was also always the possibility of expansion. To purchasing more property from the parish to make a, a bu bigger building or another, bringing more facilities or another tenant, is that what you're saying? Or? We are not at present seeking to buy more land. We have some expansion land there, right. part of the piece we already own. But I can tell you, if, if you were ever wanting to sell, um, property of this nature it's sort of a good hunting season you know it's a target <coughs> environment you've got all these Haynesville people some of whom run a very clean operation that are looking for land okay that was my main question I believe I just had for you so thank you anyone else 
Thank you, Mr. Uh, I just have one. Please. No, yeah, this, and this is, uh, this is on a broader scale. Uh, I believe it is very problematic for political subdivisions to get in the development business. Um, I, I, I'm, when you buy land and compete with private, the private sector, mm -hmm. you take the property off the tax rolls. You devalue the property owned by the private citizen. You tend, and I, I say this with all due respect, political subdivisions are not as effective at handling real estate development as real estate developers are. They know what they're doing. They get bank financing, and then if the project goes bad, it's not the taxpayer's problem. At that point, the, they lost money. What I would ask you all to consider as you take on property is, is figure out as quickly as possible how you get it back into commerce. Don't are you looking at new property if you can use it for yourself for your office space perfect i think that's wonderful if the thought is that we're going to buy property and become real estate developers i think that's the worst possible business that political subdivisions can get into amen it is a disaster name one political subdivision that's ever made a really intelligent decision in the development business the bio movement, the tree park. I mean, just look at the one. They buy this stuff and they don't know what to do with it. And it sits empty. They build new buildings that sit empty. They build industrial parks behind railroad crossings that require $3 million worth of money after the fact. My, my prayer for you is please stay out of that business. Let the private citizens and the taxpayers help them. They're your ally. Don't make them your enemy and your competitor. They really are your ally. So that's all. That's that's broad scope. But uh, no offense intended. I just think it's really something to consider. Mr. Epperson. No unintended. Uh, what you just mentioned here was brought up years ago. However, it just wasn't palatable at that time for whatever reason. So you're definitely speaking the truth. That's why you see situations that are coming up now. That's all I am. Uh -huh. Appreciate your uh, observations, Mr. Russo. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. You. Appreciate it. Have a good day. I have, I have a question. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, ma'am. Commissioner Epperson, you said this has come up once before? Oh, yeah. Way back when we had all this property, you know, we, we thought about contracting out with a realtor and let them do the marketing of it. Some situations such as that. And as a result, what happened? Uh, it, it just wasn't uh, the decision that the majority of the body wanted to undergo at that particular time. They body us? Of, of the commission, right. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the commission at this time? All right, if that, we'll move to our public hearing on ordinances, please. Yes, sir, it's a zoning case, actually zone case P6, ordinance 4998. That's to rezone property uh, out of 70th Street, Burt Coons Industrial Loop, uh, to, uh, for use of a pediatric therapy clinic. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of this ordinance? <coughs> Is there anyone here who'd like? Yes, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. My name is Philip Waddell. I reside at 9514 Bonnie Dune Drive, 7106. Uh, I'm owner along with my wife of Waddell Properties. We own this property. We, uh, we got zoning, I guess, back in 08 to build the building. It's 10,500 square feet. 8,400 of it is a uh, pediatric therapy clinic. We have 2,100 square feet left. But at the time that we built it, we weren't sure what we were going to do with it. Um, since then, we've, we've decided what we wanted to do with it, and so what we're asking for is uh, rezoning because we had to, got backed into a corner a little bit on the zoning. I don't know who would come out and oppose pediatric therapy, speech, occupational, physical therapy for kids that need it, but we had a couple folks from across the levee that did come and, uh, and oppose us. They didn't oppose FUDs or, you know, whatever, bars. 
and you know, that's what they Dixie that. Garden to us. We're familiar with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish somebody would explain it to me beforehand because I got totally blindsided by that. But anyway, so I got backed into a corner a little bit and ended up settling on zoning, just you know, kid uses to to kind of get out of air with my what was left of my behind. <laughs> and, uh, so that's what I did. So now that we want to use this space for a retail store, which specializes in energy efficient products, things like. Uh, energy efficient uh, appliances and window film and energy efficient lighting, things along those lines. Now we have to come back and ask for another use to be added to a list and that's what we're asking for and I'm just here to answer any questions if anyone, anybody has any. Ms. Lynch. So let me, is this a, I guess I should look at my thing quickly, this is an appeal? No. So we're here? No. no. I, I think it was approved by the NPC approved. With, the, with the stipulation. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would you consider serving on our Green Economy Task Force? Sure, absolutely. Because <laughs> you'll be selling energy absolutely. efficient products. Okay, yes, thank you. Anyone else have any questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this ordinance? Is there anyone here who would like to speak in opposition? Please. Next item, please. Yes, sir. Public hearing on regular ordinances. Our first one is over 4999, major economic development fund budget, and not a $5,000 for Northwest Louisiana Air Service Task, task Force study. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak in favor of this ordinance? Anyone here to speak in opposition? Proceed. Ordinance 5000, authorizes the sale of adjudicated properties. Anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this ordinance? Anyone here in opposition? All right, move on. Yes, sir, we'll move back to that zoning case you just heard, zoning case P6, ordinance 4998. The final passage, you need a motion? So moved. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Pearson, seconded by Commissioner Thibodeau. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, please vote. Raise your hand, please. It's unanimous. Thank you. Next item. Yes, sir. Well, uh, then you're other ordinances for the for the forty nine ninety nine economic development fund amendment for five thousand dollars. So moved by Ms. Lynch. Second. Second by Commissioner Lynn. First, sorry. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? If not, please vote. Show hands, please. Keep going. I can show that is unanimous. Next item, please. Ordinance five thousand sells uh, adjudicated property. So moved. moved by Commissioner Pearson. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Dominic. Any discussion on the motion? If not, please vote. Show of hands. Passes unanimously. Next, please. Uh, ordinances for introduction by title is Ordinance 5001, amend your oil and gas fund budget for an appropriation of $200,000 for Axion, Texas. Uh, DBA Axion, Louisiana, for a small business loan program authorizing authorized the cooperative endeavor agreement with that company. Then ordinance board 5002 since the sale of certain adjudicated property. All right. No work session minutes. No work session minutes. We'll move along. Resolutions, please. Uh, resolution 36 authorizes the administrator to submit an application to the MPC to have property cattle industrial park on Shirley Francis Road rezone from I-1 to RA. Move for adoption. Second. Moved by Commissioner Epperson. Second by Commissioner McCullough. Any discussion on the resolution? Epperson? No. Mr. Pollock? Ms. Lynch. I have a question. Um, this would be just to send it to the MPC, right? We're not making a decision on the rezoning. If, I'm saying if you voted yes. That's just to send it to MPC, right? Right. This would ask the MPC to rezone this property. But they would make ultimately the decision, they would right? Make the decision, and the city council would have to approve it if it was appealed. Or, or basically, sign off on it. Yes, it's not in the parish. What we're doing is we're going to take our industrial park and put it in the hands ultimately of the city council. Okay, but it was in the parish at the time. No, the parish owns the property. Oh, we own the property. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Um, Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lynn. 
I, I just want to get clarification. I've heard this a couple times, and so what we would be doing is we would be taking a park that we're in control of, giving it to the MPC, and then ultimately it'll be under the control of the city of Shreveport because it is within the city limits of, of Shreveport. Ultimately, the city would be the decide, the ultimate deciding factor in whether it gets rezoned. And the appeal would be, would go to them. It's out of our hands. Right. Exactly. Every, it, this would all be out of our hands and in the city of Shreveport's hands. Absolutely. That's, that is all I wanted to get clarification on. Commissioner Pearson? Well, I'm just trying to figure out why. I'm just trying to figure out why. I, I asked a question, I think, one Tuesday, to try to get some understanding. I, I don't know why, other than the fact that it's just requested to be rezoned and there's some reason at some later date that, that will come up. And, and I'm just struggling with it. I certainly want to be supportive, but I'm just struggling with the fact that it's, I don't know if it's anything that can that we can decide to do with it at a later date that we can't decide to do now under the same zone. If we decide we want to have it rezone at another time to accommodate whatever the issue is, then we can decide to do it. I just, I just, I'm just struggling with why would we want to do that? That's what I'm, that's what I'm struggling with. Um, and I don't know if I have that answer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Commissioner Thibodeau. Uh, Mr. Grubbs, is, since the industrial park was put together through an ordinance, why does it not take an ordinance to change it instead of the resolution? Well, uh, Commissioner Thibodeau, there, there's some ordinances that affect the park. I, the, there was an ordinance in, in the past, way back in the past, that authorized the acquisition of the park. The, the restrictive covenants were adopted by ordinance. Uh, if, if this property is rezoned, that in and of itself is not putting uh, a new use on the property. I mean, if it, the point is, I don't think rezoning the property is inconsistent with any, with with any ordinances. I, I will say that I had occasion to review the restrictive covenants when there was some discussion about turning the park back into a recreational park, which as I understand it was one time. And and I concluded that, and I think that might have been the catalyst for getting me to have a conversation with Mr. Russo about it. I concluded that if, if that was commission's, the commission's judgment, that would be consistent with the, with the um, well, it, it would be authorized by the restrictive covenants. I, I haven't looked at the covenants again since in the last couple of days. But my point is, I don't, I don't think you'd be violating any uh, uh, ordinance or the covenants if the property was simply rezoned. Now, it, it, it's possible that you would violate the covenants if the property was rezoned and then you authorized some use in the property that, was, that wasn't consistent with the covenants. I mean, the covenants contemplate industrial uses, uh, uh, but but they have some flexibility in them. And all I all I can tell you is I, I know that it would accommodate a recreational park, but that's what ended up going out there. You said that it would. I well, I concluded that it would that it would the covenants would accommodate a recreational park, but that was the decision of the commission to develop the rest of the properties. Are, recreational park. But was the purpose of the ordinance to develop the property into an industrial park? Is that what yes, the sir. ordinance call for? Yes, sir. And so if you rezone, you have automatically, it's no longer an industrial park because it doesn't have the proper zoning. So it's no longer an industrial park. My question is, is simply is whether you rezone it uh, or whatever you do, if it was created by an ordinance, doesn't it need to be um, Dissolved or dissolved by an ordinance. Now, if you're going to put a use out there that's inconsistent with the restrictive covenants that were adopted by ordinance, then you would have to amend the restrictive covenants, which would take another ordinance. All I'm saying is, just in making an application to the MPC to have the property rezoned, that's not putting another use in the property. 
uh, on the property. So I don't think that in and of itself is violating any previous action by the commission. But it removes from it the ability to have industry. Was that back correct? Back before the same process and so then it's, if it's no longer an industrial park for whatever reason through zoning or uh, through ordinance it it, uh, it just seems like to me the ordinance needs to, needs to be written if that's what happens well and and it creates some issues in terms of if you rezone it back to ra then what are you going to do with it uh, I, i've already indicated i think uh, it could be developed as a recreational park although again i i haven't checked the, to see if that's an authorized use in ra zoning uh, but if you wanted to put any <coughs> other use in out there that was inconsistent with the with the restrictive covenants then you cannot do that without amending the covenants and frankly i'm not sure you can amend the covenants unilaterally without involving the other property owner that that signed the covenants too i just i had, had an opportunity to research so basically we could end up with some property that we couldn't do anything with it. It's that's correct without going back and starting and doing the process again to have it rezoned and back to something. That's all. Mr. President. Okay, Commissioner Baker. Um, so if we pass vote to send this to the MPC through IE the city council, so if we want to change it back then they have to do the same thing. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's it. Commissioner Dominic. Um, I got a, a couple of questions for the administration. If I'm correct, I know the Ward 2 Park up in the Northern Park Parish, the Parish owns some of that property, but it's managed by the Ward 2 Park. Sir. There's a park in Commissioner McCullough's district, the North Shreveport Industrial Park. Yes. And I, I'm not sure if we own any property there or not. Yes, we do. Yeah. We, we call on property with the city of Shreveport. And then <coughs> the park that we own 100% of approximately 59 acres, if I heard correctly. That's correct, sir. This was a, obviously set up as an industrial park, a light industrial, the stuff that we're hearing from Mr. Russo to attract businesses and industries. And we're consistently talking as a commission that we need to attract businesses and create a business environment, a friendly business environment. I just have concerns of changing this from an industrial park to, to a residential. We're losing our industrial park. And on the other, if a, an industry did come and want to locate, the only two places that we're going to have is that in the northern part of the parish, which is fine with me, if we can get them to come up there, but there are logistic reasons and reasons with your Blanchard Road for the North Shreveport Industrial Park. And I think we had a couple of businesses always kind of looked at this or asked about it. And of course, when you're doing economic development, you're going to have hit, hits and miss. You're, you're just going to just take people coming and coming before you get them. Uh, you know, I just have concerns about the issues that we're talking about changing, and I guess there's some of the concerns that Commissioner uh, uh, Coach said a little ago, but uh, the same thing that Mr. Russo said, we, he, they've invested millions of dollars out there, and we're talking about changing it from an industrial to a residential, and I think once it's changed, you know, what, what is the message we're sending? Now, those are the questions. Uh, it looks like we're sending a message that we don't want businesses. That, that's my thoughts. Now, if someone can tell me something otherwise, I, I, that's just what I'm seeing with this, actually. Um, and I have concerns on that. Thank you, Commissioner Dominic. Commissioner Jenkins? Thank you, sir. Um, and I think my question has partially been answered. We still are owners of the property. And if the city rezones the property, we can come back and have it rezoned again for a different purpose at another time. And I think, you know, Commissioner Pierce, that's part of what I struggle with on this too. I'm going to support it. Let me go ahead and say that now. But that's a part of what I struggle with on it too. Are we locking into something that can never be changed again? And, and I don't think that's the case. I think if we retain the ownership of the property, um, 
The only reason it's going before the city is because it's within the city limits. We can come back and and ask to have a property rezone again based upon whatever purpose we want to use it. And I mean, with that, that's why I'm going to uh, support uh, the manager because I don't feel like it's a permanent lock-in at this stage. Thank you, sir. Anyone else first round? Uh, I have a couple of observations. Um, I'm listening to what Mr. Jenkins is saying. No, you're right, Mr. Jenkins. You can come back and change it, but, you know, then, then it's less marketable. It's, it's much easier to get the type of industry and businesses and jobs here, Mr. Russo was talking about, when you're already zoned for it. Now, you know, you just made another hurdle once this thing is rezoned back residential agriculture to overcome. How do you market that property when you don't have the zoning? You have to find somebody interested and said, okay, we'll go through the zoning process and get it zoned back. But the, the, my other main concern is that when the park was created um, and, and marketed, that, that there was a commitment made to Mr. Russo's company, and we've marketed as such uh, in the past that, that the commitment was made that this was a light, light industry park. And, and if we come back and change this, and in effect, maybe devalue their property, inhibit the, the you know, uh, potential for their property value to increase by having light businesses come there, then I think we do them economic harm. And I think we're disingenuous uh, as far as not following up on the intentions or the acts of our predecessor. And there are actually, you know, uh, people on this body right now who voted to create this park. Uh, but my main concern is this, and I, I share Coach's thing. I understand that there's uh, some residents out there that have some problems, I understand. But we're not gaining jobs in Cattle Parish, we're losing jobs. I, I don't care uh, if uh, that trucking company that we ran off would have opened its 200 jobs. All that is doing is temporarily buffering for the continuing loss of jobs out of General Motors and their suppliers. So we're just really in replacement mode, mode, hold mode, tread water mode, whatever you want to call it. But we're not really seeing any net gain. Now hopefully we're all working, and I know Mr. Epperson and everybody at this state, as hard as we can to try to find a solution to General Motors. But all we're doing is maintaining. And I'm concerned that potentially, uh, and to backtrack one second, then I'm finished. By the way, during the moratorium, which we could not discuss this property with anybody. We had three companies called wanting to know about it. And basically they had to be told, sorry, we're under a moratorium, can't discuss it with you. Three companies. We very possibly could have that park full by now had that moratorium not been in place at that time. And they were Hainesville related people. And those are jobs, those are good jobs. I know the people in that district need jobs, people in this parish need jobs. My concern is by doing this, to make the road a little safer or the neighbors a little happier. What I don't want to do with my vote is hurt more people than we're trying to help. And that's what I can't get past. And I truly think that ultimately we're going to injure and hurt and deprive of economic opportunity and advancement. More people that we're going to help by this. Mr. Russo made an interesting point. There is no fire. I think we can sit back and get a little information. This thing's been going on. There's no ongoing negotiation. There is no fire. I think we need to step back, take a deep breath, look at this thing. And if there's another use for it, and some other people have expressed a use that benefits the parish, I want to hear about it. I don't believe in genies in a bottle. I want to hear about it. All right, now we're going on second round. Ms. Lynch. Uh Quickly, you mentioned that three companies were um, interested in the park. Is that documented somewhere? Do we know who those <laughs> were? I know. So they, I have first-hand information as president of the commission that that information was forwarded to me, and okay. and in a, in a search for guidance, and the bottom line was, you know, hey, crush, silence, crash, can't do anything. Well, let me let me. Uh, can I uh, request that information since the ban has moratorium has been lifted? If, uh, if, the, if, if, the, if the administration actually it. has the information, if they actually documented anything, if they have anything to provide from you, uh, they will. Okay. Is that documented? Uh, as soon as the, Robert receives some phone calls of inquiry over that property, and he can tell you the company, 
Uh, we, we did receive the calls inquiring about whether the space was available out there. Yes, ma'am, there was a phone call. We often get phone calls from the uh, chamber as well as Miles Russell, we use the Economic Development Foundation. We get those by telephone calls. And, and most of the time we get emails as well. Okay, so we have actual names of three companies, of those three companies? Um, Yes, ma'am. I know Mr. Mr. Glass, would you provide to Ms. Lynch with, yeah. or an enemy member of this body, whatever you may have in regards to that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank yes. you. Um, my second, I guess, observation is this land was residential initially. Is that is that correct? Mr. Jambor, was this initially, initially? Right. Which I guess my question, my I guess what I'm thinking is, is I don't want this to be almost made to seem like it's a crime to go from industrial back to residential because it was it went from residential to industrial. Well, yes, ma'am. It was residential agricultural, which in many ways is a residual category. Undeveloped land right, right, is right. residential agricultural, and that's what this was. Right. It's not like there was ever a subdivision there that was removed. Right. It's been undeveloped. Exactly. Okay. So it, let me let me just clarify that yeah. um, the parish has no control over the zoning. That's correct. Anyway. Yeah, you're con well, except as property owner. Except as the property owner. Correct. Well, not. No, it's not universal. MPC. Right. Let me put it this way. It is theoretically possible for the MPC to rezone somebody's property out from under them right. without their consent or willingness. Right. But it's a very rare situation where that right. occurs. But the point I'm making is MPC controls the zoning, not the city council. Correct. And not it would be the just as if y'all had to own a piece of property in New York. So if someone came in, is it, it's zoned industrial now. Mm -hmm. If someone came in and wanted to do something under the residential classification, they would come to MPC. It would have to be rezoned. And ask today. that it be rezoned. If they, want, if they wanted to develop it for residential subdivision. Or anything that falls within that classification. I guess that's probably it, huh? Right. And, and developing as a residential subdivision is not with, within the rights in industrial property. You would have to rezone have to come it from back industrial. And rezone it. You couldn't put uh, residences there. Or, if, or even though it's industrial, if someone wanted to do something outside of the covenant, then would that come to us or would that go uh, to the them? covenant's where we tend to stay out of. You, okay. you, those are so district court tends to enforce those. Okay. So if someone wanted to do something industrial in there. And it violated the covenants. Then I would have to go to court. Right. Generally somebody would sue somebody to enforce those covenants. Right. We would tend to stay out of that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, that's that. Okay. I mean, we look like we control nothing anyway. But okay, all right. Thank you. Yes, Miss Lynch. Um, Commissioner Thibodeau. The bottom line there is, if the if the zoning is now changed, uh, there won't be anybody looking at that property for industrial purposes because they'll see it to be RA. So. They wouldn't even look at it for, for an industrial purpose. And let's say it was the other way around. Let's say that the property had remained RA and that somebody had built a subdivision there and part of that on 30 acres of that 59 acres and they invested money in houses and now someone, <coughs> now for whatever reason, the commission decided, well, we want to make that other 29 acres industrial. Well, number one, you know, we have, uh, I think broke an agreement with those people who, who own homes because as soon as that property becomes industrial, then the, the, the value of their homes will deflate. And it's the same thing here on the opposite. We have made an agreement with a company. They spent money and came in uh, under the agreement that we gave them. And now, it, unless we're able to leave the zoning as it is, we will probably uh, do value their property, and certainly that would bring us a liability issue. So, uh, at the very least, I would hope that we would slow down and relook at, at all the negative reasons not to do it. And and basically, I, I think each of us honors, in most cases, what the person who uh, the commissioner from each district wants when it comes to something that has to do with their district. 
But this is an industrial park that belongs to the entire parish. It does not belong just to one district. And it affects the entire parish, people of the entire parish. So uh, that's, that's why I've been so adamant about not changing it, because it is an asset for the whole parish. And uh, if it were just a piece of land that we wanted that was sitting out there and the commissioner wanted to uh, do something with it for the benefit of the people, then that's, that's not a problem. But when you've already made promises and commitments, uh, you got to keep them. And, and that's, that's why I am with it now. Thank you, Mr. Thibodeau. Mr. Lynn? Mr. Carr, um, in reference to both what Commissioner um, Thibodeau and Commissioner um, uh, like on, on uh, Escobade said in reference and the devaluing of the property, that how would Caddo Parish be responsible uh, as far as making up the difference to the devaluing of property? I guess first it would have to be proved that we devalued property and then we would would we be legally liable? Well, I'm just not, I mean, that's very hypothetical, Commissioner. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, if you're asking me to say if we rezone the property down to RA, that that the Wheeling Company would have a cause of action, uh, cause of action against us. I'm not. I'm not prepared to say that. Okay. And frankly, if I thought they did, I wouldn't say it publicly. Well, Mr. Lynn, you okay. can't ask Mr. Grubb to make a case for them. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, Mr. Jambor. I know that there's certain restrictions on zoning, or at least uh, that's my understanding. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But it's easy to go one way and not easy to go back the other. And so going from industrial to residential, um, and then people build their houses knowing that it's industrial, and then they develop their property knowing it's industrial, and they're, and they're comfortable with that when they bought the property, and then they're new that all of a sudden we change it to residential then when we try to go back to industrial again we're within so many feet of them and we're not allowed to go back it's you know it's very much an easier case to down some zone something Thank you. without a very you know valid reason as opposed to increasing the rights but you know quite frankly i thought mr escaday uh tagged it very appropriately it's you know, it's very hard to market a property without any rights. It, it slows you down, and that delay for you know legitimate businesses uh, is costly. You know, three months waiting is three months of time invested, and depending on the size of your company, that can be a substantial amount of money. And we, the same issue we have in Highland that you've heard me talk about. You know, when you have the Roman Coliseum, thumbs up, thumbs down, and you come. And there's virtually no rights on a piece of property it's difficult to market it to anybody thank you in in light of, of having no sunshine on what's supposed to be going there and this the plan that is unknown for this property i i can't support this and i'll, I'll vote against it thank you mr jenkins my question was asked thank, thank you commissioner Gavinu. um mr gamble i just got a a couple of questions I want to get clear on my mind. Um, I'm trying to play up and down with you today. That's okay. If this went forward and we request an application to rezone this to residential, MPC is going to go out there and do their study, etc. If MPC said no, it needs to stay industrial, then it's going to go to the city of Shreveport for approval. The city of Shreveport right. could have It's a piece of legislation. It would go to the mayor. Right. It was finished. The city of Shreveport at that time could say, no, we want it residential, and it would become residential, correct? Okay. okay. If y'all, and once it's residential, okay, let's just say it is residential, and two years down the road, if we, we decided to make application for, hey, we want this back to be industrial, and y'all recommended it be industrial, the city of Shreveport could say, no, we want it to right. keep it residential. And let me ultimately in, in the hands of the city of Shreveport, which Commissioner Anson yeah, said. And, and I think that's maybe what, and let me restate my answer to Commissioner Lynn's good. Yeah, you know, when you want to downzone oh something God, as the property owner, you're extensively saying, well, I know I have these rights, but I really don't want them. Let me give them back to you. 
Yeah. So the Planning Commission would be, and the City of Shreveport, as the ultimate authority, would be in a very awkward position to say, we're no property owner, you really don't know what you're doing, we're not going to let you be stupid enough to give away these rights. Right. That, that's ostensibly what you'd be saying. You know, so they're going to do it if you really want them to. Back okay. There's no reason for them to deny that. But what, what Matthew was alluding to is that when you go back the other way, it's an entirely different situation. I understand. I mean, uh, yeah. Now, I you're, all, now you're asking for rights that you already gave back. I think we all understand that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did that answer your question, anybody? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to make sure I was clear with the okay. way the procedure would work. And I appreciate it. You bet. Commissioner Dodman. Yes. Commissioner Pearson. I, I think I think I've got a grip on my trouble. I think I've got a grip on it. Zoning is about land use, and, and most of the time that I can remember, we always had a land use issue before we decided to rezone something. And and I, I think that's where my, my, my trouble is. Most of the time, that's what we've done in this body. We, that I can remember, and I say most of the time because I can't remember another time when we did, when we just rezoned something because we wanted to rezone it. Most of the time, we rezoned property because it was a land use issue or there was some use of it that we wanted to see at that property. And so, I don't see, if, if I knew of a use that I thought, that I felt that was strong enough to rezone it for, then I would be clearer as to whether or not I would want to vote to rezone it. And I'm just not clear because I don't know of a use that we need to rezone it for. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, my final thought is I, I agree with Commissioner Pearson, and uh, I'd like to see us slow down and, and look at some alternative plans. If there is a plan, a reason to rezone this property, then, then it's certainly worth looking at. Uh, as Mr. Jambor indicated, I'd hate to give up our rights <clears throat> once you have them. It's not quite as bad you know, <clears throat> as losing your virginity because you can never get that back once you do that. But it is very difficult. <laughs> and and I, I'm like Carl. I'm 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 a. Keith said he was verified. I'm I'm really kind of perplexed about this, and I'm angst about this as much as as I would like to support my fellow commissioner in, in this effort, and I have in the past. It's just not like somebody wanting to have a liquor store in the neighborhood or another family dollar where there's another one six blocks down. This is this is this is very difficult. So I'm I'm going to vote against this in, in hopes that we can we can back up, take a deep breath, and maybe have some more information come. There's nobody squawking at the doors on this property right now, and there's no smoking gun or there's no fire. And I'd rather not act foolishly, and maybe in time. Uh, I can be compelled to, to see a reason or vision as, as to why we should do this. If there is no further discussion, we will vote on the resolution. All voting yay. Commissioners Epperson, Jenkins, McCulloch, and Lynch voting nay. Commissioners Dominic, Thibodeau, Escadet, Baker, Pearson, and Lynn. The motion fails. We know the business. We are adjourned.